there's a very subtle but key point that the Buddha gets at when it comes to our intentions with, with regard to our practice that I think are sometimes uh, misunderstood or, or overlooked. And what I wanted to, to do in today's video is to discuss one of these, a, a, a strange issue having to do with karma that reflects upon this attitude we should have to our practice. Lovely to have you here. Uh, Doug's, I'm Doug Smith, trying to give these videos that helps us to live a wiser, kinder, and calmer lives. And one of the ways I think that we can do that is by coming to understand Buddhist karma better, or at least with the ideas that the Buddha had to say about karma. In a recent video, I discussed a, a, a sutta in which the Buddha discusses a number of issues with a couple of uh, of ascetics uh, who practice different paths, the cow duty and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, and the dog duty ascetic. Uh, I'll, I'll leave a link to that video down below in the notes. But after having a discussion with these two ascetics, he then goes on to discuss this, these issues with karma. He discusses four kinds of karma. It's the fourth kind that's the particularly important and strange one. First, however, I'll discuss the other three. That'll give us something of an idea of where the Buddha is going here. The first is called dark karma with dark result, or we could translate that as dark actions with dark results. Now, what does the Buddha have to say about this? What this is, is it's when somebody makes hurtful choices by way of body, speech, and mind. Now, we should understand, therefore, that karma Although it's understood as action, uh, that's the literal translation of the word karma, actions can be done obviously with our body, with our speech as well, by saying things that are in this case hurtful, or even with our mind. In other words, to think hurtful thoughts is also a problem. However, in another, in another sutta, the, the Buddha gives an even darker interpretation of what this kind of dark karma might mean. In that sutta, he says this, he says, it's when someone murders their mother or father or an arahant, that is to say an awakened person or an enlightened person, they maliciously shed the blood of a tathagata, that is to say a Buddha, or they cause a schism in the Sangha. Now in this case, this is particularly extreme because these examples are examples of what the Buddha considers to be literally the worst kinds of actions that we can undertake, killing our parents, killing an, uh, an enlightened person, or injuring, or of course, killing the Buddha, or a Buddha. Uh, now, the last two of these, or I should say, the last, that is to say, injuring the Buddha and uh, creating a schism in the Sangha, were two things that were, uh, that uh, uh, the Buddha accused his cousin Devadatta of having done in the early texts. Devadatta is sort of this uh, evil foil of the Buddha, uh, who, again, injured the Buddha and tried to split the Sangha. Uh, and so, pretty clearly, this is in, intend, in, intended to refer to him, to Devadatta. But, as I say, I think it's a little bit too extreme, because clearly we can do uh, hurtful things by body, speech, and mind without going quite as extreme as all that. Now, the second sort of karma is bright action with bright result. And here, the Buddha describes it this way. It's when someone makes pleasing choices by way of body, speech, and mind. So that's not really surprising. And here we can contrast this with the prior case where someone makes hurtful choices. These are choices which don't hurt. They, they please people around us. They make people happy or create pleasant sorts of environments for people around us. The Buddha goes on to describe this in another sutta this way. It's when someone doesn't kill living creatures, steal, or commit sexual misconduct. They don't use speech that's false, divisive, harsh, or nonsensical. And they're content, kind-hearted, with right view. Now, this passage is only found in the Pali tradition, to my understanding, but nevertheless, it seems to point to the, the, the fact that these kinds of bright actions with bright results follow along with uh, what are known as right action and right speech in the Eightfold Path. A right action involves just these uh, examples here of not killing, not stealing, not, not committing sexual misconduct, and right speech involves the other parts, 
uh, not lying, uh, not uh, giving divisive speech or harsh speech, and not speaking uh, nonsense, that kind of thing, or gossip as another way to translate that. So that's pretty much pretty clear uh, what's being discussed here. Then at the end he says that to do these kinds of bright actions with bright results, we're supposed to be content and kind-hearted, that is to say not grasping for things that we, that we, that we don't need. Uh, and kind-hearted, we, we're, we're filled with loving-kindness. Uh, these are perhaps a little uh, extreme. I mean, we don't necessarily need to be filled with loving-kindness in order to do bright actions, but it certainly helps. And then he says that, they sh that, that the person should have right view, which, again, seems to me a little bit extreme here, because uh, w when we speak of the vast majority of humanity, uh, most people are not going to have right view in the Buddhist understanding of the world, and yet they certainly ought to be able to do bright actions with bright results, that is to say, uh, doing things that are, that are beneficial and pleasant to people around them, even without necessarily having this kind of right view. So uh, it's not entirely clear what's being said in this passage, but in any event, I think we understand the general picture, which is that, you know, people should be doing right action, right speech, in, 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 in a general line with the Eightfold Path. Now, the third example is called dark and bright actions with dark and bright results. While the Buddha doesn't really have much useful to say about this particular example, I think it's one that we intuitively ought to understand. That is to say, many of the things that we do are somewhere in between. They're not completely harmful to other people, but neither are they completely helpful either. Uh, there are ways that uh, perhaps we're somewhere in between. Many jobs, let's say, uh, involve some aspect here, where some of what we're doing is helpful to other people around us. Perhaps we're producing a kind of a, an object or device that's useful in a certain way, but also it's harmful in other ways. Perhaps it harms parts of the environment, perhaps it harms some of the people who are working. We I think we intuitively understand the picture here, and it may even be arguably that most of what we do is in this third kind of karma. And then the Buddha, with each of these, talks about the results. Again, dark and bright results here. Uh, the bright results, or I should say, the, I'll begin with the, the dark results. The dark results uh, mean that we are going to feel some kind of pain in the future, or uh, a negative kind of future if we continue to do the, the, the kinds of things that cause dark results. And with the ones that cause bright results, we're going to feel some kind of pleasant thing in the future because of them. This is how karma generally works in Buddhism. Uh, traditionally, it even works uh, into future lives, so that if we do the dark ones, we'll end up in a bad place, perhaps even a hell realm, as they're understood in Buddhism. In the second case, we'll end up perhaps even in a, hell, uh, in a heaven realm, according to in, in the Buddhist understanding. These are temporary realms, all of them, but nevertheless. And the third one will end up in a place that has dark and bright uh, 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 kinds of uh, results for us such as the human realm. A human realm is a realm that's uh, not a heaven, it's not a hell, it in includes b uh, examples uh, of both ple uh, pleasures and pains. Now it's the fourth kind of karma that's the strange one. That karma he describes as neither dark nor bright actions that lead to neither dark nor bright results. In another place he describes this as actions that lead to the end of actions, or karma that leads to the end of karma. And what could he possibly mean by this? What kinds of actions are these? Well, perhaps some of us have the idea that he must be talking about enlightenment here, or nirvana. And indeed he is. Nevertheless, the situation is a little bit confusing. Oh, in a couple of different suttas, the Buddha goes on to explain what kinds of actions these might be. In one sutta, he says that this involves actions along the lines of the Eightfold Path. These are neither dark nor bright uh, actions leading to neither dark nor bright results. And in another sutta, he talks the same way about actions following the seven factors of, of awakening. Again, these are kinds of, uh, uh, of different actions that we can take, a different path that we can take that leads towards awakening or enlightenment. I've done videos about both of these. I'm not going to go through all seven or all eight. Uh, it would take too long, but uh, I'll leave links to those videos down below in the notes if you want to know uh, what these kinds of things are, what, what all the 
the, the factors in each of them are. But the, the weird thing here is that when it comes to the first example that, that actions following the Eightfold Path are neither dark nor bright, is that we've already seen in a prior example that right action and right speech are supposed to be bright actions that bring bright results. So how can it be that f following the Eightfold Path both involves bright actions that bring bright results and that are, that are actions that are neither dark nor bright bring neither dark nor bright results? It's a bit of a conundrum. Of course, they can't be both at the same time. I think the key here, this is at least my understanding or my interpretation, is that the key here has to do with the intentions that we bring to our actions. Indeed, in one sutta, the Buddha famously says that by intention I mean action, or the, uh, I should say, by intention I mean karma. It is our intention that brings, that brings us the karmic results that we get out of the action that we undertake, given that intention. And indeed, in one place, the Buddha describes these neither dark nor bright actions bringing neither dark nor bright results this way, he says, they are the intention to give up dark deeds with dark results, bright deeds with bright results, and both dark and bright deeds with both dark and bright results. Now that's a little confusing, perhaps, but let's bring it a little bit more down to earth. How can we do a beneficial action? How, what kind of action would be a bright action with bright result? Well, one example might be to be generous. To be generous is the opposite of stealing, right? It's not stealing, it's being generous, it's giving something away. Well, one way that we might be generous is to give something to somebody in the expectation that we're going to get something back from them in return. A uh, perfect example of this are, are people, uh, wealthy people perhaps, who donate large amounts of money in order to get their names up on a building. The work that they're doing is helpful, it's beneficial for society, but they're also doing it in a way that's ego-directed, that's going to bring something back to them by giving them prominence in the community. That is to say, the intention with which this good action is done is subtly ego-directed or overtly ego-directed. Now, that's not to say it's a bad action. Indeed, for the Buddha, any kind of generosity is good but it is indeed ego-directed. Now, another way we might do that same action is to do it with the intention of wearing away the ego. That is to say, we're not doing the action in order to get something back for ourselves, like our name on a building or something like that, but rather we're doing it simply in order to stop grasping, perhaps we realize that we're grasping our wealth too strongly, and so we donate it so as to, as an example to ourselves, not to hold on to it so much. Here we're talking about the same action done with a different intention. Now, clearly this is not a dark action, uh, it's beneficial, uh, but it's not a bright action either, which is the surprising thing. It's neither dark nor bright, so it leads to neither dark nor bright results. That is to say, it seems from this understanding that, let's say, donating money on behalf of yourself without any intention of getting anything back, just donating money in order to wear away your own sense of ego, is not the sort of action that will lead to heaven in a future life. It will not lead to a beneficial, that is to say, a a result that is pleasurable and pleasant. At least that's the picture we're getting here. Instead, it will lead to the wearing away of the self, and it will help, of course, lead to eventual enlightenment. That's the idea. That's, what the, that's the picture the Buddha is getting at, at here, at least as I can understand it. Uh, but it is a subtle and complex point that the Buddha is making, so I'd be interested to hear your own thoughts on the matter. Now, I've done a number of earlier videos on this whole idea of karma and ways we can understand the Buddha's uh, notion of karma, and I'll leave a link to a playlist up here on the screen if you haven't seen these videos of mine. 
If you're getting something out of these videos, uh, consider taking a look at my Patreon page, which is linked down below, and see if you want to help support the channel and the work that we're all doing here. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next video, and meanwhile, all of you, be well.